Even though I'm down with the flu, we still move. It's exam week. Grab your paper. Hello and welcome to MK's Exam Secrets. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at exam questions in a clinical course. This is season two, episode four. We are going to be focusing on internal medicine. You already know the drill. You may pause the video at any time to actually scream the answer at your screen or write it down so that you can give yourself a chance to revise and see how well you are off the mark or how ready you are for exams. So please, Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So beginning with our question one, a 42-year-old woman was admitted with a three-month history of undue tiredness and palpitations. She denied having chest pains. Her appetite was good, and she lost a lot of weight. She often felt very uncomfortable in hot weather. On examination, she looked tired and anxious. Her BP was 160 over 80. Pulse was 130 beats per minute and regular. Her apex beat was not displaced. She had a conjunctival pala, but had exophthalmos. The full blood count electrolytes and liver function tests are normal. Urea 10, creatinine 139. Blood sugar 6.7, serum free T3 10.2, the normal range is 5.6 to 9.6. Then chest x-ray was normal, ECG showed tachycardia. What additional history would you get in this patient? What further signs would you elicit in this patient? Comment on the above investigation. What is the most likely diagnosis? What further blood tests are you going to order? What is the triad associated with this disease? So you may pause the video right now to actually... Um, scream the answer at your uh, screen. And here comes the answer. So when you, what you have to have keep in mind in this patient is that this patient may actually have hyperthyroidism. How do I know that she has a hyperthyroidism? One, the fact that she's having these cardiovascular symptoms, so things like palpitations, uh, things like chest pains, things like uh, uh, high blood pressure, things like uh, uh, tachycardia. So that's a pulse that's greater than 100. And of course, the apex speed not being displaced. And she has exophthalmos. Already having this issue of this uh, heat intolerance should point you towards hyperthyroidism. In addition to this, we see that the T3 levels here are high. So about 10.2, much higher than the normal range. So you should keep in mind that this woman here has hyperthyroidism. So you should ask for a history of syncope, history of insomnia, diarrhea, which are associated with hyperthyroidism, a prior history of menstrual irregularities uh, or infertility, a history of dysphagia if she may have a goiter, history of dyspnea, night sweats or even excessive sweating, and then also a, a past drug history of the current medication. Is she taking any exogenous thyroxine? Is she taking any beta adrenergic drugs? Like for example, in asthmatic patients that are taking salbutamol. Then, of course, your past medical history of diabetes, asthma, as well as HIV. And do not forget to ask for a past medical history of thyroid disease, as well as a past family history of thyroid disease. Then, of course, past thyroid surgeries or radiation therapy, history of oral contraceptive pills, as well as history of alcohol or smoking. Then, what further signs are you going to elicit in this patient? So, of course, they might there may be fine tremors, there may be sweaty palms, there may be a goiter. You may have lid lag, you may have lid retraction, you may have pretibial myxedema. Then comment on the above investigation. So here you're going to be having a raised urea and creatinine. Of course, there is also a raised T3, uh, which is higher than the normal range, and an abnormal ECG, which is pretty much showing tachycardia. So your most likely diagnosis is that this person has hypertension, though we cannot really rule out if this is an a single time event or she has always had a high blood pressure, but we're assuming that she's always had a high blood pressure. So they have hypertension secondary to hyperthyroidism, most likely caused by Graves' disease. Now, remember that Graves' disease is actually a condition that is 
an autoimmune condition that's very common in women where you have these autoantibodies that are going to be uh, synthesized and these autoantibodies are going to be formed against the, or rather stimulating the, the TSH receptor and re resulting in increase in production of T3, T4 and a decrease in TSH. So you'd also want to check for the levels of serum 3 uh, T4 as well as TSH, and then also check for this TSH-like antibodies and antithyroglobulin antibodies. And of course, the triad that's associated with Graves' disease is the goiter, exophthalmos, as well as pretibial mix edema. Moving on to question two, a 42-year-old patient with fever for three days, weight loss, increased thirst, and passing a lot of urine. Her respiratory review is unremarkable. She is not hypertensive and has no significant medical or surgical history. What other questions would be relevant in the history to make a diagnosis? What investigations would you order in this patient? What is the possible cause? List complications of your diagnosis. So you can actually pause the video uh, right now to actually scream your answer at the screen or write it down, whatever works for you. And here comes the answer. So keep in mind, before I actually flip over to the answer, keep in mind that this is an individual that's been having this uh, history of a fever that could indicate that there is a, some sort of infection that is there. And of course, they're giving us features of diabetes. So things like weight loss, increased thirst, as well as passing a lot of urine. So keep in mind that this patient could possibly have diabetes. So you want to ask for a history of diarrhea. I want to ask for a history of dysuria, even history of polyphagia. And of course, ask for a medical history of HIV in the past a medical history of diabetes in the past, and a past family history of diabetes, a drug history, especially if they're HIV positive and they're taking protease inhibitors. These are an example of drugs that are diabetogenic, as well as if they're taking other medications like antihyperglycemic agents. Then, of course, what investigations would you order for? So your serum, urea, electrolytes, and creatinine, because this person could be dehydrated. And because they have been losing a lot of water, they could be going into renal failure. Same thing with the hepatic dysfunction. That's why we also want to order for liver function tests. Want to order for an FBC DC, um, a creatinine, um, C-reactive protein rather, as well as an ESR. These are just simply going to tell you that there is an infection and there is some inflammation that's going to be taking place in the body. And of course, to find the focus of inflammation, we can take a blood culture, we can do a urinalysis and urine microscopy culture sensitivity. On the urinalysis, we'll obviously look out for glucose in the urine, we'll look out for the ketones in the urine. And of course, you may order for your serum ketones, do your arterial blood gases to actually see the pH of the blood. It may be acidotic. And then of course, your random blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, and your oral glucose tolerance test. You may also even go on to order your hemoglobin A1C to actually look at the glycemic control over the past three months. And of course, possibly this woman here could have diabetes mellitus, but we cannot rule out whether she is in DKA because we're not really given the um, values of the ketones in the urine or any presence of glucose in the urine. And for crying out loud, this could also be diabetes insipidus because it may also present to you with features of passing a lot of urine and, and features of thirst, although you may not have this characteristic fevers and the weight loss that is associated. Then, of course, the complications of diabetes include the long-term complications and the short-term complications. Short-term complications include hypoglycemia, which is often uh, due to the treatment. It includes uh, hyperglycemic, hyposmolar state in type 2, which I don't think this patient has. This patient rather has a type 1 type of diabetes. Um, so you can actually include that on your diagnosis as a type 1 type of diabetes. Then, of course, long-term complications include diabetic neuropathies, diabetic nephropathies, diabetic retinopathies, and, of course, the micro and macro. There's supposed to be macro and geopathies. So include things including like uh, cardiovascular disease, even diabetic foot, as well as diabetic foot ulcers. And, of course, the complications of DKA may include things like cerebral edema, deep vein thrombosis, as well as a coma. Then moving on to question three. You are not a confident medical student. You know that the question is bad when it starts off like this. You're not a confident medical student after cardiac rotation. And now you've been asked to do a cardiovascular system examination, concentrating on auscultation of the heart on a few patients in a cardiac ward. You are able, you are well able to appreciate the murmurs, which you report to your examiner. Uh, you are asked to give differentials for the murmurs. Please list one valvular cardiac condition against each of the following murmurs identified. A, a pansystolic murmur in the left 6th intercostal space, mid-clavicular line radiating to the left axilla. 
B, a diamond-shaped high-pitched systolic murmur in the right upper sternoboda radiating to the carotids. C, a pan-systolic murmur in the fourth intercostal space, left sternoboda, which is louder on inspiration. D, a diastolic murmur in the third intercostal space, right sternoboda, which increases on expiration. E, a low-pitched rumbling diastolic murmur occurring after an opening snap at the cardiac apex. List the drugs used in the management of heart failure and state why each of the drugs mentioned is used or benefit from the drug. You may pause the video. I know that was like a mouthful to actually read. It's also like a mouthful to actually take in. So you may pause the video right now. If you have no idea about murmurs, I had an introductory lecture about heart sounds and murmurs and how to identify them. And I also explained a little bit about the basics as a prelude or a stepping stone to valvular pathologies that we will cover later on the, on the channel. So I'll leave a, a link and at the end of this video, as well as in the description, where you can actually check out heart murmurs and heart sounds. So click on that if you have no idea about this question and learn that before your exam. So here comes the answer. So a pansystolic murmur in the left sixth intercostal space, midclavicular line radiating to the left axilla, that's a murmur that's characteristic of mitral regurgitation. Remember that the regurgitant murmurs are going to be found in systole because in systole, that's where you have contractility and that's why these valves are meant to close. Then, of course, uh, a diamond-shaped high-pitched systolic murmur in the right upper sternal border radiating to the carotids. This is aortic stenosis. A pansystolic murmur in the fourth intercostal space, left sternal border, which is louder on inspiration. This is tricuspid regurgitation. A diastolic murmur on the third intercostal space, right border, which increases on expiration. Now, here, there's going to be a lot of debate that I know in the comment section below because when you talk about aortic regurgitation murmurs, characteristically, they're not heard best on the right side. They're heard best on the left side. But in a special kind where you have aortic root disease that's actually causing the aortic regurgitation, you often hear the murmur on the right side of the sternal border. So this is obviously an aortic regurgitation, which is obviously due to aortic root disease. Now, of course, a low pitched rumbling diastolic murmur occurring after an opening snap at the cardiac apex is going to be characteristic of mitral stenosis. Now, remember the drugs we use in heart failure? These are going to be including things like diuretics, which are used to control congestive states, so they promote loss of fluids from the body, um, a drug like furosemide, then of course, the positive ionotropes like digoxin, which increase cardiac contractility as well as the cardiac uh, output. The digoxin has also been shown to decrease the heart rate. And of course, vasodilators like ACE inhibitors, as well as angiotensin receptor blockers, which tend to slow down cardiac remodeling. They also decrease the preload and the workload on the heart. Then of course, this is ultimately going to increase the survival rates of the patient. And of course, beta blockers also tend to reduce the workload and oxygen demand on the myocardium. So those are some of the drugs that we do use in the management of patients with heart failure. Then moving on to question four, a 25-year-old man presents to the emergency department or emergency admission ward with a history of severe headache for the past month. He also has fever, vomiting, and neck stiffness. He was recently diagnosed with HIV, but has not yet commenced his art. What is the most likely diagnosis? What are the two variants of the organism causing this presentation? Differentiate the Brzezinski and Kerning sign. List four indications of a lumbar puncture. List three contraindications to performing a lumbar puncture. Give the normal parameters of cerebrospinal fluid appearance, cells, glucose, and proteins. You may actually pause the video right now, but here comes the answer. So this is where reading the entire question actually benefits you. Because if you answer something else here and you get to this part two where they ask you about two variants, you obviously be stuck. So an organism that ha often has two variants that will present to you with these severe headaches that are chronic and lasting over a month with some fevers and neck stiffness is obviously cryptococcal meningitis, which is one of the common causes of meningitis in HIV patients. So this is obviously cryptococcal meningitis and retroviral disease, WHO stage four. Remember, whenever you make a diagnosis of HIV, you should always add your WHO staging. And of course, the two variants are cryptococcal neoformans, variant neoformans, and of course, cryptococcal uh, Neoformance variants GATI, remember that GRUB is no longer considered as the variants that cause um, meningitis in humans. And of course, the two signs with the kerning sign, the patient is going to be lying supine on the bed. And then, of course, passively extending 
the patient's knee on either side with the hip flexed and look at the patient for spasms. So in, in English, pretty much the patient is laying flat. And when you try and bend the hip and bend the knee, and then when you try and straighten the knee, then of course this is going to be limited because of the meningeal irritation. And of course, Brzezinski's sign here when there's forced flexion of the neck, this elicits a reflex flexion of the hips. So the patient will still be flat. You try and flex the neck passively. And then of course, you see that their knees are getting off the bed or they're being flexed or their hips are getting off the bed. Then of course, a list of the four indications of a lumbar puncture. So remember, indications may be diagnostic, like for example, in meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cerebral malaria, even demyelinating disorders. And of course, they may also be therapeutic like in cryptococcal meningitis to reduce the intracranial pressure. Then list four, three contraindications to performing a lumbar puncture, so cardiorespiratory instability. If someone is in respiratory distress, if someone is hypotensive or hypertensive, we do not want to do a lumbar puncture. And then of course, if there's an increased intracranial pressure, that's due to a mass, which is why you must order for imaging first prior to you doing a lumbar puncture. And of course, if there's an infection over the puncture site, uh, avoid doing a lumbar puncture and bleeding disorders, avoid doing a lumbar puncture. And then of course, if the patient declines the procedure, then you can't do a lumbar puncture. So just pick any three. And of course, the normal parameters, which I think I answered in the previous internal medicine MK's exam secrets, uh, the appearance is obviously clear. The cells are less than 10, the red blood cells per high power field, less than five white blood cells per high power field. Then the proteins are 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 grams per liter. Glucose is two thirds to a half of the serum blood glucose. And moving on to the last question, a 35 year old female patient presents to live in Manawasa General Hospital with arthritis of the small joints in the hands and a seizure disorder. She has a history of being unwell for three months now and has had some episodes of irrelevant talking during this period. Two weeks ago, she noticed some eruption on her cheeks, which have persisted until now. Her past medical history is only significant for anemia and history of miscarriage. On admission, you decide to do a urinalysis which showed the following parameters. Protein 3+, plus, blood 2+, plus, glucose nil, specific gravity 1.015. I feel like I've done this question before on the channel. If I have, please bear with me. There are a lot of questions that I had to go through to search for these questions. And of course... Just drop a like for some support as well as a comment. And what is the likely diagnosis? Mention five clinical features you would look for. What could be the rash on her cheeks? List three diagnostic investigations you would request for. What is the likely renal complication in this patient? So you may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So as you can see, this woman has arthritis. Okay, some joint swelling. This woman has a seizure disorder. This woman may have some CNS involvement. And of course, some eruption on her cheek, history of miscarriage, history of anemia, and of course, blood and proteins in the urine. This is, if you look for one condition that links all these symptoms, it's obviously systemic lupus erythematosus. It's always lupus. Then of course, mention five clinical features you'd look for. So on the skin, you'd look for malar rash, discoid rash, Reynolds phenomenon. And then of course, serositis may present to you with a pleurisy or pericarditis, which is going to be causing your shortness of breath. And of course, your chest pains and then on the mouth and the face, you may get this painless oral and the nasal ulcers. And you may also have non-scarring alopecia. Then the rash is obviously a malar rash that she has. And when you want to make a diagnosis, of course, your antinuclear antibodies, your ANA, your double-stranded antibodies, you may also order for your anti-Smith antibodies, as well as a renal biopsy. And this complication that she has is obviously lupus nephritis because you're losing both proteins and you're losing both blood and the urine. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of uh, MK's Exam Secrets. I know my voice wasn't so good. I have a code, but I am doing this for you. And I hope you really do well at your exams. And we shall continue with exam week. So if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. <music>